We're going to get started. Welcome. I'm Brian Myers, Planned Giving Officer for Church Health. Uh, we're excited to welcome you all to our second webinar, Giving in a COVID World, Why 2020 is Still the Year for Charitable Giving. This will serve as somewhat of a part two to our previous webinar in September, um, and we'll continue on to unpack the provisions of the 2020 CARES Act and show how they can be best put into practice this year. Uh, we're excited to welcome back our panelists from last time around, Eustace Corrigan of CBiz and Perry Green of Waddell and & Associates. And we're also joined today by Bill Smith of CBiz. Um, excited to have him. He is the director of CBiz's National Tax Office and a regular contributor on uh, numerous national news sites, such as the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, MSNBC, Fox News, and others. Um, during the course of this webinar, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit those into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll try to address any questions that you may have in real time, and we'll direct any uh, further questions to our panelists at the end. Uh, we're going to get started today with a quick greeting from Church Health's founder and CEO, Dr. Scott Morris. Dr. Morris. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us, and I, I can't uh, say... Uh, how grateful I am for Perry and Eustace again, and, and Bill, thank you for joining us. Um, I, I just wanna re remind everybody here at Church Health how important um, your gifts are for us and, and how COVID has impacted us. Uh, certainly um, there's the issue of the people who actually are positive for the disease, but that the bigger challenge is in Memphis, 100,000 people have lost their job when they lost their job, they lost their health insurance, and when they get sick, where do they go? Uh, literally yesterday, I, I see this young man uh, sort of break your heart. Um, back in August, he broke his hand. He goes to the emergency room, they do the right things, they put a splint on it, and then they tell him to go to the orthopedist. Well, he calls, he can't afford to go, and um, he just carries on, he keeps trying to work. Uh, he came to see me yesterday in December to say, do you think his hand is healed? Because he's still wearing the splint they put on in August. So I take the x-ray and y'all, it is a, not a pretty sight. You know, what he needed in August was surgery, which had he come to us then, we would have been able to help him. But he knew he was uninsured and he didn't know about us. Now, moving forward, we're going to do the best we can with him, but he's a great example of what COVID has done that has literally nothing to do with the virus. So with that said, um, Perry and Eustace and Bill, uh, thank you guys for leading us through the CARES Act and the tax consequences for this end of the year giving. So I'll take it back to Brian. Thanks, Dr. Morris. Uh, we'll just do some quick intros for our, for our speakers today. Um, to begin with, uh, Eustace Corrigan is the Senior Manag Managing Director of the Memphis Office for CBiz. Uh, collectively, our panelists have over 100 years of experience with uh, tax and estate planning. Um, our second speaker is uh, Perry Green. Uh, so Perry began his career with uh, Ernst & Young. He is now with Waddell & Associates, where he serves as the CFO and Senior Wealth Strategist. Um, Perry and Eustace are both members of Church Health's Plan Giving Advisory Board. Uh, and lastly, today we are excited to welcome Mr. Bill Smith. Uh, he is the Managing Director of CBusiness National Tax Office. And today, Bill is going to bring some valuable insights as to what we should expect coming off the election what are some things we need to keep in mind legislatively and tax-wise uh, moving further past this year? So with, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Eustace. Uh, sure, Brian. Uh, let me get my act together here and get us going. All right. Uh, so as Brian mentioned, we did this webinar a couple of months back just to kind of give a more broad overview of, of the CARES Act and the impact on charitable giving <clears throat> and the provisions in there that, would, that were intended to spur and, and 
uh, encourage more giving this year, especially in a very challenging year for nonprofits. Uh, and this, so that in, in that particular webinar, we went a little more granular into the, the law and some uh, scenarios, case studies. This this time around, we're going to be, we'll spend a little less time on that because I think more importantly, what Bill's going to speak to in terms of the the planning relative to the legislative possible potential legislative changes coming next year depends on a lot of things, a lot of factors that, that, that roll into that. But I think that's that in and of itself probably weighs more heavily into uh, people's charitable giving uh, plans going into year end. Uh, so disclaimer for the presentation. Uh, as typical information in this presentation is a brief summary and may not include all the details relevant to your situation. Please contact your service provider to further discuss the impact of your specific facts and circumstances. Uh, the way we kind of broke this down, uh, first and foremost, I'm going to give a kind of an overview of the rules and the CARES Act provisions, then flip it to, uh, to Perry, who's going to kind of go through the planning points and a couple of uh, real high level scenarios, and then quickly on to Bill to give more of a tax legislative update and, and his uh, perspectives. Uh, I thought first and foremost, what's always a good reminder for people is what are the deadlines? We get this question a lot. What are the, I wanna give some stock, I wanna give cash. What are the deadlines to get that in so I get that deduction secured for this year? So here you have just a, a simple chart, uh, credit card, obviously, you know, submit by 11.59 p.m. on December 31st, whatever time zone you're in. The check or cash needs to be postmarked by December 31st. Uh, you know, wire, you have the uh, information there, stocks and bonds. So if you have appreciated securities you want to give, check with your financial firm, whoever you use. Uh, everybody has different rules. Usually it, it can take anywhere from two to six weeks. So if you, if you plan on giving stock to your favorite charity, uh, please start investigating that, looking at it now so that you, you understand that you can't just wait for a few days before December 31st to give stock. Uh, so those are the probably the more common uh, giving devices that we get questions around is, is that, you know, cash, credit cards, and, and stocks. So again, check with your, uh, your providers as well to, to get that information so that you're well prepared. Uh, from a charitable deduction standpoint, uh, the general rules are, there's a pretty easy aspect to it, or simplified, and then you have the complex aspect relative to the limitations. Uh, I guess the easy aspect is, okay, to get a charitable deduction, it's got to be a completed gift to qualify a charitable organization. You got uh, the substantiation requirements need to be met, and you need to be an itemizer if you want to take the deduction for the charitable contribution, which means your total itemized deductions need to exceed the standard deduction for whatever category of filer you're, you're in. Uh, if you were to be an itemizer and you have uh, charitable deductions that are deductible, uh, then you look at the limitations relative to what, where your, your adjusted gross income is. So you're going to hear AGI a lot in this presentation. AGI stands for adjusted gross income, and it's that total on your 1040 on page one that gets down to a number, age adjusted gross income, before you make certain adjustments for itemized deductions and other items that gets to taxable income, these are the taxable income. The general limits are uh, specified here, 50%, 60%. You get into uh, more uh, donations of property, that's where you get into different levels of 30% or, or even 20% limitations of your, of your AG, AGI. Um, so slide on the rates. One thing, the big takeaway on the tax tables for 2020, just know, keep in the back of your mind at the highest uh, rate is 37%. 35% is, uh, is the second to highest rate. So, so those are important to know as you, you move into speaking about any kind of proposed tax changes in, in the future. Um, as far as the, the glossary of tax code and the legislative references, I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, just know TCGA, the SECURE Act and CARES Act, are uh, there are changes made in each of those acts that impact charitable contributions. Uh, but then the CARES Act on this slide for 2020, uh, the 100% AGI deductibility for qualified charitable contributions, 
uh, that limitation, the 60% limitation has been suspended for this year. Uh, we have the taxable income limit for C corporations. We, it was increased to 25% from 10%. And then food inventory, to the extent that applies, uh, those limitations are increasing 15% to 25% of taxable income. Uh, so there's a good little summary of kind of the other, other provisions in the past couple of years that have impacted uh, charitable giving uh, for typical uh, individuals. The CARES Act itself, uh, you can really kind of break it down to uh, between individuals and corporations, but generally speaking, overriding, you have to define what a charitable contribution, qualified charitable contribution is, which is uh, cash to a public charity uh, during the calendar year 2020. So that is paramount to taking advantage of the provisions in their, in, in, within the CARES Act, uh, as well as uh, maximizing your, your, and optimizing your, your position. From an individual standpoint, um, the partial above the line charitable contribution deduction. So this is the, the $300 uh, deduction that you hear about out there that is for non-itemizers. So if, you, if you're an individual who only qualifies for the standard deduction, you can take a deduction in 2020 for $300 to the extent you give $300 in cash to public charity above the line, meaning above, before adjusted gross income, before AGI. Um, what's interesting is that a lot of people out there default to thinking that it's 300 for single filers and 600 for married filing jointly. It's not, it's $300 for the single filing unit. There is a move within Congress right now, discussion to increase that to 600 for single filers and 1200 for married filing jointly. Not sure if that's gonna make it through the latest bill, but that's that's been, been discussed. Um, moving on, as far as the provisions impact in businesses, uh, talked about that being now 25% of, of taxable income versus 10%. We don't see that a lot. I think a lot of corporations have budgeted out their, their giving for the year, uh, but the fact that some companies have made less money this year, this 10% versus 25% limitation could, 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 uh, could, could be effective. This visual, this is a nice visual of the AGI limitations by, by year. So in 2019, we were at 50% 50, 50 of, of AGI. So this breaks it down for you uh, in terms of what, what, could, what you could do if you stacked your, your contributions and you mix the contributions relative to property and, and cash. Uh, in 2019, uh, if you are all cash giving, if all you gave was cash to qualify charitable organizations, you could deduct up to 60% of AGI. In 2020, as you see here, you can go all the way to 100% of taxable income or, or, or typically your, your adjusted gross income, uh, and you could stack your deductions this way. This could all be cash, or you can give a mix of stock and other appreciated property or even give to your donor advised funds. Um, now, of course, if you did cash all the way to public charities, you can get the full deduction up to your 100% uh, of your AGI. It reverts back as it stands now and beginning in 2021. Those that relief of the limitation goes away, would go back to 50% if you have mixed uh, property being donated and 60% if it's all cash. Uh, from here, I'm going to turn it over to Perry to uh, take us through a couple of scenarios and discuss some strategies that, that we're seeing out there in the market. Thanks, Eustace. Um, I'm going to talk about a, a couple of things. The first one is a bunching of charitable contributions. And so what we're going to do here on this first one is just assume that there's no real changes to the tax law over the next four years. And so we've got somebody that gives $40,000 a year to charity. They've got $10,000 for more in property taxes, state and local taxes, but that's the cap on what they can deduct. So they 
they take itemized deductions every year of $50,000, which is more than the standard deduction. So over that five year period, they get $250,000 worth of deductions. But if you've got the opportunity and the ability, then instead of doing the charitable contributions over time, they can come through and lump all of the charitable contributions into 2020. So if they do that, they take, they end up with $200,000 worth of charitable contributions this year, the property taxes. So their itemized deductions are $210,000. And over the next four years, they don't get to itemize. A lot of people think that's a bad thing, um, but the, the government allows you to reduce your, your taxable income if you make qualifying contributions. Um, in this case, they only had $10,000 worth of property taxes. So they took the $24,000, $24,500 standard deduction. And over that time period, because they lumped all of the contributions into year one, they were able to take $308,000 worth of tax deductions versus 250. So it got an extra $58,000 worth of tax deductions over the five year period. So that's how it works in general. But what I wanna take a look at now is somebody that's higher income and what happens if the proposals that Biden campaigned on um, come to fruition. So let's just assume you've got adjusted income of a million dollars a year from 2020 through 2024. So you've got the adjusted income. In addition to that, you have a little bit of a mortgage. So $12,000 worth of mortgage expense each year and $10,000 worth of state and local taxes. Well, in addition to that, they're making $100,000 a year worth of itemized, or excuse me, worth of charitable contributions. So if the rules stayed the same, then they'd have $122,000 worth of itemized deductions every year. But one thing that Biden discussed on the campaign trail was bringing back something called the peace limitation. So that's a rule that says if your income is over a certain threshold and Biden's talked about bringing it back, not having any tax increases for people making below 400,000. So somebody that's making over $400,000, if that's gonna be the limit, then they're making a million. So 3% of that excess is non-deductible. So instead of being able to deduct $122,000 each year going forward, it would be, still be 122 this year, 104 in the future years. And that answer is still better than the standard deduction of 24,800. So if that were the case, that's the first thing that you've got to worry about. The next thing that um, he's discussed doing is raising the tax rates. And so the current maximum tax bracket is 37% and talked about bringing that back to the 39.6% that it was um, prior. So the thing that we're ignoring in this is the net income, net investment income tax, but um, that's gonna be the same regardless probably. So, and then the final thing that he's talked about doing is capping the limit of the, the tax benefit of itemized deductions. So for example, in 2020, if I have $100,000 worth of allowable deductions, I'm in a 37% tax bracket, my taxes go down by $37,000. However, next year, if I had $100,000 worth of allowable deductions, we've got that 28% cap, then the tax goes down by $28,000. So what ends up happening is nothing's changed from 2020 through 2024, except for the rules that are applied. So the tax increases from 262,000 this year to $298,000 next year. So the total deductions over that time period is $538,000 and the total tax due is $1,454,000 and some change. So what happens if you make one change and you've got the ability to lump all of those charitable contributions into the current year? So you still got the same interest in, and state taxes going forward, but this year, instead of taking a $122,000 deduction, take a deduction for $522,000. So 
going, what happens is going forward, that piece limitation really doesn't apply because your total, your total deductions were only $22,000. So even though $18,000 comes into play, you still get the standard deduction each of those years for um, $24,800. So that's what you end up with. The taxable income is gonna be significantly lower this year, higher in the future years, $478,000 this year, $975,000 in the future. Um, marginal tax rates go up and the cap on the itemized deductions comes into play. So what ends up happening if you lump everything into this year, your tax due today is almost $117,000 versus basically 320 in the future years. So the total deductions over that time period is $621,000. It's an extra $83,000 worth of deduction that you get over the five years. And the total tax due ends up being a million, basically a million four, which is a tax savings of about $56,000 over that time period. And that it's about 60% of the additional deduction, but it's because you get to take, uh, you, you get to take the full amount. You don't have the piece limitation to worry about. And then also you're, taking the deduction at a 37% rate versus a 28% rate. So that's what would, that's the potential benefit of lumping. We don't know exactly what's gonna happen. Bill will get more into the details in a little bit. Um, the rules could change like this, um, but we know that they definitely won't be any better or more favorable than they are in 2020. So the next thing we wanna talk about is looking at possibly doing a Roth conversion. So um, what's the benefit of doing this? If you've got somebody that wants to make a large charitable contribution, they want to take the full tax deduction this year and their income's not high enough, but you can take traditional IRA balances, convert them over to a Roth. That will increase what your taxable income is this year and which can be offset by the deduction. And then everything that you've converted to the Roth grows tax-free for you to use later for yourself or to pass on to your children. So let's take a, a, a look at an example. So we've got somebody that's got two and a half million dollars worth of income, um, two million dollars uh, salary bonus um, passed through from a business, whatever, however that comes in, a half a million dollars worth of long-term capital gain. So their adjusted gross income is two and a half million dollars. But what they're, what they're wanting to do is make a large gift that's going to have a huge impact at church health or wherever else, you know, if they want to spread it through different organizations of $5 million this year. But because their income is two and a half million dollars, they're limited. And so you end up with some carry forwards. And over the next five years, you would, you'd end up deducting two and a half million dollars worth of this. So what you'd end up with is um, the cash contributions carry forward, the charitable, the, excuse me, the appreciated stock carries forward, but your tax due this year is, is zero. So what happens if we want to take the full deduction this year? Well, in that case, we can come in and they've got enough cash outside, plus they've got the, the IRA balance, have this person make a two and a half million dollar Roth conversion. All that comes in and it's, it's taxable. Normally somebody's not going to want to do this, but if you've got the ability to offset that 100% with charitable contributions that you're planning on making anyway, it's, it's a huge win for the charities and for the taxpayer as well. So what ends up happening is they make charitable contributions of cash. They can use a little bit less cash and appreciated stock goes up. So those two things, as you'll see, um, come in and then my, my total allowable, it, excuse me, my total allowable contribution ends up being that full $5 million. So, you know, the, the benefit here, like we said, is the full deduction year one, everything comes out of the IRA, basically tax-free, grows for future years tax-free. And then also we were able to use more appreciated stocks to avoid even more capital gains tax. 
So those are the two big things. And then one other thing that we wanted to talk about is uh, qualified charitable distribution. So this is something where the law allows you after you're 70 and a half to take a distribution from your IRA, as long as the check's made payable to the charity, then it comes out, the money comes out of the IRA tax-free. And this is really beneficial for older donors that are not itemizing. So if if your mortgage is paid off, you've got five, you know, your marriage got five thousand dollars worth of property taxes, you're not going to be itemizing. If you take ten thousand dollars out of the IRA and then turn around and make charitable contributions, do whatever else with it, you um, you don't get a you don't get a tax benefit. You you pay tax on the money when it comes out, but you don't get a deduction because you're covered by the standard deduction. Well, in this case, if you have that money come in, the, the checks made payable to Church Health, then it never shows up in your taxable income. So you basically get um, a double deduction on that. So that's that, that's something that is available not only in 2020, but future years as well. So definitely something to keep in mind. And I think, you know, that's, that's kind of the high point. So that also, that, Charitable distribution also helps you offset what your RMD would be. I think now I want to turn it over to Bill because he's going to talk about really the most interesting piece. Um, you know how how likely are these changes that we've seen on the campaign trail to really come to to fruition? Thanks. Thanks very much, Perry and Eustace. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, I did want to mention a couple of things before we jumped into this. One is that uh, in addition to everything that Eustace and Perry talked about, keep in mind that charitable contributions when it comes to IRS audits is one of the most form over substance areas that exists in the tax law. You have to dot every I, cross every T. If you get into one of those situations where you need evaluation, it has to be a qualified appraisal by a qualified qualified appraisal by a qualified appraiser. You have to have your donor acknowledgement letters that indicate you didn't receive any property or services in return. And the IRS wins every one of those cases having nothing to do with whether, whether good property was given at the right value to a qualified charity. The next thing is there really isn't any math in my presentation, so you can sit back and relax. All right, so let's jump right in. Next slide, please. Eustace, are you turning slides? Yeah, I got it. There we go. Yep. Okay. All right. So probability of tax legislation. We've got the House of Representatives, first of all. And the source here is Ballotpedia as of December 3rd, about five days ago. You've got 435 members of the House of Representatives, which means you need 218 for majority. Going into the election, the Democrats held 232, the Republicans 197. Uh, the remaining six seats were either vacant or party switching, people switching parties. But the Democrats held a pretty strong majority and thought they were going to increase that. Well, the, the backlash of the blue wave in the midterms turned into a little bit of a red wave, uh, catching the Democrats somewhat by surprise. They will still hold on to a majority in the House, uh, but with six Seats still left to call. The Democrats have 222, so they've got the majority. They lost a net 10 seats, and the Republicans picked up a net 10 seats against the uh, Democrats and picked up a libertarian seat. So the Democrats will hold the House. And before we move forward, just wanted to say that we're talking about tax legislation here, but don't forget there, there are some other competing interests. Uh, the first two things, and we're assuming uh, a Biden administration that President Trump won't get the election overturned, and we're going forward talking about uh, Biden presidency and what might happen with that. But they have to do what they like to call in Washington, stand up a new government. So you've seen news of President-elect Biden naming his potential uh, cabinet members and they're trying to get everything in place. And then the first item of priority, of course, is gonna be a comprehensive stimulus package. And we'll talk about the current state of that, but they're gonna to wanna to do that before they do anything on the tax side. 
And because generally this is going to be a tax increase, there'll be pressure on the administration to get it done early in the year. You can pass a tax decrease in December like the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017 because nobody has to plan to pay less money in taxes at the end of the year. But if you're going to have to pay more money in taxes, you want the ability to do that and plan for that as early in the year as possible. So, all right, let's move on to the next slide. That brings us to the Senate. Of course, there are 100 Senate seats and 35 of them were up for election, 23 Republican seats, 12 Democratic seats. That meant the Democrats thought they had a better chance of flipping Senate seats. In order for the Democrats to have their slimmest majority, they'd have to get to 50 seats and then the vice president could vote uh, on any tie. That being said, right now, it's 50 seats Republican, 48 seats Democrats. If the Democrats can get to the 50 seats, that means before the vice president can vote, they would have to get every Democratic senator to vote the party line. And there are some very conservative Democratic senators, so it's not a slam dunk that even if they have the House and 50 seats in the Senate and they get the vice president, that they're going to get their tax bill through. Okay. Also, a huge stumbling block for the Democrats is without the so-called supermajority of 60 votes in the Senate, which they certainly are not going to get because the Republicans already have 50 seats, the only way to pass legislation is through a parliamentary procedure called reconciliation, which involves the so-called Byrd rule. And the two big items there are is that you can't pass legislation that's going to increase the deficit beyond a 10-year budget window. And then one thing that will affect the Biden plan we'll talk about is you can't do anything to affect the Social Security Trust Fund, okay? So you gotta have 60 votes to circumvent a filibuster or you've gotta have legislation that allows an increase to the deficit outside the tax legislation. So in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, for example, they authorized an increase to the deficit of a trillion and a half dollars. And the corporate tax rate decrease from 35% to 21% cost approximately a trillion and a half dollars, which meant all the other provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act combined had to be revenue neutral. Okay, next slide, please. So what are their other options? Oh, first of all, we are now left with Georgia. Georgia is on everybody's mind right now because that's where the two Senate runoff elections are going to take place, and they're not going to take place until January 5th. Why is that important? Because when we still had didn't know who was going to win the election, we thought that we pretty much know what happened in terms of the president, the House, and the Senate on or after November 3rd, pretty close there too. Well, that all got flipped on its head because we have the runoff elections in Georgia, and we have 50 seats for Republicans and 48 for Democrats, which means if the Democrats were able to take both of those seats, they would get to that 50-50 number and we would be able to guesstimate what you might be able to do. But you can't do that before the end of the year now. And given what has happened in Georgia, where they just went through their third recount of ballots, we may not know what the Senate makeup is until well after the inauguration on January 20th of President-elect Biden. We have Kelly Loeffler against Raphael Warnock in one of the elections and Purdue versus Ossoff in the regular election. The conservatives in Georgia or the Republicans in Georgia are feeling confident that the state will go back to its normal conservative uh, leanings, particularly to try and offset the balance of power now that uh, Biden has been declared president-elect. Uh, interestingly, the voters had up until yesterday to register for the runoff election. So both sides were trying to get everybody registered who wasn't already registered. But we're not going to see results from Georgia until well after December 31st, which threw a lot of planning into chaos. Next slide, please. If the Democrats get their 50-50, one option might be to block the filibuster. So remember, the 60-seat majority, supermajority, is to avoid filibuster, but they can vote 
to eliminate the filibuster for specific uses, and that is called the nuclear option. They love uh, names like that in Washington. It's been done before. The Republicans did it in 2017 to avoid filibusters of Supreme Court nominees. The Democrats did it in 2013 to avoid filibusters of other judicial and executive branch posts. And it's been talked about. The minority whip, that's sort of the uh, second in command, if you will, in the Senate. The Democrat Dick Durbin said Democrats would definitely consider that if they got to 50-50 and well, and he said it at the time, if they took control of the Senate, maintained control of the House and got the presidency. So that is still on the table. We'll have to wait and see where that pans out. But just keep in mind that two major takeaways here. We don't know what's going to happen on the possibility of Biden tax legislation until we know the results of the Georgia uh, elections. And we have to worry about uh, all of the Democrats, if they get to 50-50, voting the party line. Okay, next slide. This is just kind of an interesting slide. It shows you in five-year increments where the federal government gets its tax revenues from. So, for example, 2019 versus 2014, you can see a dramatic drop in the red corporate income taxes due the directly attributable to the decrease in rates from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act for C corporations from 35% to 21%. That had to be made up for primarily by individual income taxes. So you can see uh, a pretty significant jump there from 2014 to 2019. But way back in the good old days of pounding corporations, back in 1954, 1949, a huge chunk of it was red, meaning corporate income taxes. Now. Social Security has picked up a huge chunk. You can see that way back in 1949, going way up to uh, 20, 2009, for example, where it has increased dramatically. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so what are the tax proposals that Biden has been floating? And it would be nice if there was a formal plan posted on the Biden for President website or something, but there isn't. So we've had to glean all these from interviews from campaign promises from similar sources to figure out what it is he wants to put together. And again, reminder, they've got things they have to do before they do this, even assuming they get to 50-50 in the Senate. If they don't get to 50-50 in the Senate, that means Mitch McConnell retains his Senate majority leader position, and he is notorious at not bringing things to vote that don't square with the Republican Party line. So it's going to be a a very rough road if the Democrats don't win both of the Senate runoff elections in Georgia. So he wants to take the corporate rate back up from 21% to 28%. That's uh, halfway back because it dropped 14 points in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and it's going back up seven points under his plan. Interestingly, back in the Obama-Biden administration, 28% was a bipartisan number that everybody agreed it would be Good to drop the corporate tax rate to to try and keep our large corporations competitive on a multinational level. But uh, President Trump wanted to drop that even more, so it went to 21%. The sticking point back then was what do we do about pass through entities since such a large percentage of business in the United States is done through pass through entities? They couldn't come up with a solution. Uh, as you know, in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, they had the uh, Qualified Business Income Deduction, Section 199 Cap A, that's the 20% deduction on active trader businesses that aren't service businesses that are disqualified. So that's how they dealt with it in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. President, as President Biden would want to also impose a minimum tax on corporations with book income over $100 million. He stumped saying he doesn't like to see uh, Forbes 100 or Forbes 500 corporations with huge book profits and paying no income tax. On the international level, he wants to eliminate the repatriation benefits and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. You had a, a repatriation toll charge, um, but the, a, the repatriation regime was not eliminated. He also wants to double the guilty tax. That's taxes uh, on earnings over 10% on invested foreign assets. He wants to take that from 10.5% to 21% phase out the QBI deduction for 
people with income over $400,000. So $400,000 is sort of the magic number for the Biden tax plan. $250,000 was the magic number for the Affordable Care Act. So it's gone up for $150,000 in the 10 years since the ACA and the Biden tax plan. He also wants to eliminate the carried in interest preference. That's a partnership rule. It really sort of got some um, press when uh, Mitt Romney revealed his tax returns and showed that he was paying an effective tax rate of approximately 14% on millions and millions and millions of dollars. That's where you get a profits interest in a partnership and you're able to take distributions out at long-term capital gains rates. Uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, scaled that back a little bit by imposing a three-year holding period, but President Biden would want to eliminate that altogether. In the energy world, he wants to end fossil fuel credits, restore electric car credits, and uh, various credits for businesses using energy efficiency. Next slide, please. He also has a 10% manufacturing communities credit to revitalize, renovate, retool existing facilities. Uh, it would have to benefit local workers and communities. It would have to if, increase manufacturing wages above a stated pre-COVID-19 baseline. And he'd also uh, give credits to small businesses for adopting workplace retirement savings plans. There'd be a new 10% surtax for companies that are manufacturing offshore products they want to import back into the United States. That would raise the effective rate to 30.8% on them because remember, he'd take the corporate rate up to 28% and the 10% surtax would be another 2.8% on top of that. Next place, individuals. What's he going to do with individuals? Well, as Terry mentioned, he wants to take the maximum rate back up to the ACA levels of 39.6 from the 37% drop in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act for people with income over $400,000. He wants to increase the capital gains rate to that level also for people with income over a million dollars. It hasn't really been clear whether that applies to just capital gains income over a million dollars or any income over a million dollars, but that would mean that if you put the net investment income tax 3.8% on top of that, you have an effective rate on 43.4% for long-term capital gains. So that's that's a big tax increase for investors. Uh, he did promise not to increase taxes, as Perry mentioned, for any family with income under $400,000. Um, uh, Trump campaigned on the fact that he was going to raise income tax on 80% of American households. That was based on the presumption that he wanted to repeal the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in toto. He said he didn't. He was going to leave everything else in place. He would have a new earned income tax credit and dependent care credit that would give up to a maximum of $16,000 up from $2,000 for child care and a new $8,000 credit for caregivers if you're taking care of someone with physical or cognitive impairments. As Perry mentioned, he'd bring back the P's limitation for taxpayers with income over $400,000. That is a phase out of the benefit of your itemized deductions and limit the benefit of those itemized deductions to 28%, as Perry demonstrated ably in his uh, examples. Next slide, please. He wants to let workers 65 and older and workers with no children claim the uh, EITC, he wants to, this is big for estate planning. He basically wants to roll all the estate and gift provisions back to 2009 levels. So what does that mean? Right now we've got the state tax exemptions of 11.58 million and 23.16, if I recall correctly, for an individual or a married couple wants to roll that back to three and a half million index for inflation. So that would be three and a half individual seven for a married couple. The Tax Foundation, which is a conservative think tank said in October that that would raise about $281 billion over the next 10 years. So between this and the uh, increase to the corporate tax rate, it's possible that Biden 
would not have to worry about reconciliation and getting the supermajority because he has in overall, it looks like a tax increase. Remember that part of the problem with the supermajority is you can't increase the deficit over the 10 year period. But if he imposes an overall tax raise, he could get his bill passed with just the 50 plus the vice president. So again, just incredibly important, this Georgia race on January 5th to what might happen to taxes over the next four years. Also remember that many of the provisions other than the corporate tax rate cut in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act sunset after 2025, but there's a midterm and a full presidential election between now and then. So Biden has further incentive to get his plans through. He wants to raise the top, top estate and gift tax rate to 45% from its current 40%. It got a drop under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Another controversial provision is he wants to bring back the Social Security tax on wages over $400,000. Currently, they're capped at 137.7, so you'd have a donut hole between that number and 400,000, and then you'd have to start paying Social Security tax again. Going back to the supermajority, remember the two parts of the bird rule, one, the deficit increase, the other was you can't impact the Social Security Trust Fund. It's possible he won't be able to get this because it might be impacted by that second bird rule provision because it's going to impact the Social Security Trust Fund. He wants a first time home buyer's credit of $15,000. He wants a renter's credit that he's willing to pump $5 billion a year into to try and hold the line at 30% of monthly income. If you're over $400,000, you would be ineligible to engage in like-kind exchanges. That's where you sell investment real estate and within a certain period of time, you reinvest the proceeds and you don't have to pay any tax until you ultimately get out of the deal. A couple of things we're interested in that he hasn't really spoken of is salt cap. Is he gonna get rid of the salt cap? We don't know for sure, but it seems like given the pressure from lots of key senators like Chuck Schumer, who never stops talking about it, uh, it would be in any plan. That would be good for a lot of the highly populated blue states, which have the high, some of the highest state income tax rates. Also, the net investment income tax kicks in at that $250,000 level, which was the ACA uh, definition of wealthy individuals. Would he bump that up to $400,000? We'll have to wait and see. Next slide, please. Okay. Eustace, do you want to take over and go through the year-end charitable yeah. planning? Sure. No, uh, thanks, Bill. That was great. Uh, so what does all this do in terms of impacting year-end uh, planning for charitable contributions? Uh, obviously, as you heard from Bill, consider the probability of the outcome of the Georgia elections, I think, and any kind of decisioning, uh, that's one thing you really have to factor in is the probability of the outcome of those elections. And then even given that, what is the likelihood of, of any change in tax rates in 2021? And Bill, I'm gonna probably put you on the spot, but let's just say it does go the way of the Democrats uh, in those elections. And, and there is legislation, tax legislation that is uh, attempted to be enacted in 2021. Uh, could you have retroactivity of the rates, of any changes in rates to the beginning of the year? Yes, absolutely. It's a great question, too. And that sort of ties into my comment that there'll be pressure to get a tax bill passed earlier rather than later, because we're assuming that whatever bill gets passed is going to be retroactive to January 1. There's no prohibition on that. You're allowed to implement retroactive tax changes. So everything we're assuming would go back to January 1, which is why people will need that early decision on any tax changes so they can plan on what they're going to have to, you know, estimate and pay during the year if their taxes are indeed going to go up. And there is, um, I forgot to mention, but you probably read about it. There was the bipartisan bicameral proposal for a stopgap stop gap $908 billion stimulus package. It looks like now that tomorrow there's going to be a vote on a one week continuing resolution because they had to pass a budget bill by Friday. The stimulus aspects were holding everything up. They couldn't get agreement. 
So they're voting on a one week extension to keep the government going by something called a continuing resolution for another week so that the government's funded for another week and they can hopefully come to a stimulus agreement. And again, that's going to be a stopgap stimulus agreement, which means the first agenda item for the Biden administration will be sort of a longer term stimulus agreement going forward. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, and the last, uh, you know, last two points, I'll turn over to you, Brian, for, for Q&A. Uh, from a decisioning standpoint, uh, you have to decide whether you want to defer any contributions to capturing a greater benefit due to potentially higher rates next year but also consider accelerating into 2020 to avoid any additional on-demand deduction limitations, uh, the PEAS limitation and 28% limitation that, that Perry went through earlier. So uh, that's kind of some closing thoughts on, on planning for, for 2020 in your end, general contributions. Uh, Brian, I'll turn it over to you for Q&A. Really appreciate y'all, that was excellent. Um, we do not presently have any questions, um, but if, if anyone has some, you think of something at, at the end of the webinar, our presenters have generously uh, included their contact information. You're welcome to reach out to any of them, to me, any of our staff at Church Health. Um, but uh, I'm gonna just gonna close by turning it back over to Dr. Morris, uh, just to give a little goodbye to everybody. Look, y'all, I can't tell you how grateful I am for Perry and Eustace and Bill for their time. Um, you know, it's important from church health perspective to, to make sure those people who support us understand this incredibly complex world around taxes. Um, I will say I am always heartened to know that uh, most people don't actually make their charitable giving based on what the tax implication is. Some people do. Uh, but most people um, decide to give because it's in the nature of who they are and they believe in the cause. So, um, you know, I, from a church health perspective, that the need for the work we do right now is greater than it has ever been before. Um, I, I will tell you the, the line at our door has never been so long. And um, so we are uh, hoping that uh, at the end of this year, people will um, sort of say supporting church health is what I want to do. And, and perhaps there's um, uh, some waves here that there's a tax benefit um, that can help you this year. So anyway, thanks to everybody for joining us. And uh, I am truly grateful for uh, our presenters and for Brian for bringing us all together. So everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Morris. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, and y'all, uh, Webinar recordings for this and the previous webinar from September will be made available. We'll also send slides from today's presentation to all attendees. Just want to again thank our presenters and thank everyone for coming out. Uh, 